Welcome back to another episode of What Are You Made Of with your boy, the unstoppable Mike C. Rock. I'm in the house today with a fella that I met on Clubhouse through one of my favorite people, Amelia Antonetti. She was interviewing him. And, you know, the way I work, guys, I just reach out when I want to talk to someone and very nice and willing to come on the show and share what he's made of. And I'm happy to have Joel Rolampagos with us. He's a TV executive producer, founder of the mental wellness company, Change Your Algorithm. And also, Joel, what, what shows have you produced real quick So uh, while we're in the bio section? Yeah, I was with NBC's The Biggest Loser for about 10 years. I executive produced a show with Ashton Kutcher called Going From Broke. And right now I'm with LeBron James's company, Spring Hill. Awesome. Yeah, so guys, uh, he's into some big things. And Joel, welcome to the show, first of all. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. And second of all, we always start the show with this question, what are you made of? So let's get into it, man. What are you made of? I am made of a lot of passion and this passion came from, you know, great moments in life, but the most passionate things I am about are from the traumas I've had in my life. So I'm excited to speak more about that. That's what makes us stronger. Yeah. So I don't know uh, if you know anything about me, but I just want to share with you. I wrote a book called Rocket Fuel and it's about converting setbacks and becoming unstoppable. And that's the book back here. I dealt with a lot of abuse growing up. Grow up around a lot of broken people. Don't remember my parents ever together. I know there's a lot of people out there the same. Most of us don't talk about it though. Right. And we're embarrassed maybe, we're ashamed. We think nobody cares. But I think the most important thing, and I'd love to hear you speak to this. I think we underestimate the power of our story to inspire millions of people. Oh my gosh, 100%. 100%. I think we're, a lot of us, I know I used to be one of those people was in extreme denial about the fact that I had some things and some setbacks that I needed to deal with, right? I remember that uh, when I first started to get into entertainment, it was just very much like a front and a facade. And I wanted that success because money meant success and staying busy meant you were successful. But the more that I did this, the more that I was really running away from my own emotions, um, unhealed traumas, as I was talking about. And those are really the things that makes us stronger. So I couldn't agree more that as soon as we address these things that uh, have made us feel bad for so long, that's when we actually become stronger. Yeah, yeah. Look, man, I, I said this in the book. And by the way, there's two ways to look at this, what you can use for fuel. For the longest time, I had to use all that bad stuff. And I would store it in my tank instead of my trunk where it weighs you down like most people do. Mm. And I was able to convert it into to rocket fuel, as I say, to become unstoppable. Because if you take all the stuff that slows you down, all the stuff that blocks you and remove it and use it as fuel, dude, you're unstoppable. Now, the, the thing, and I, I'd like to get your take on this too, is there's a, some point where our engines become refined enough where we can't use that low octane, dirty, toxic fuel anymore. Right. We have to figure out a higher octane. And for me, what I found out is that it's the targets and goals and dreams that we set out for ourselves as we're a more refined engine. And that stuff starts to pull you instead of push you. Would you agree with that? 100%. I mean, we're talking about car metaphors here and you can't, you know, you can't fix the car while the engine is still running. And so I needed a moment to just stop. And as a recovering control freak, I'm like, I'm not, I can't stop. Like, I, I just need to go, go, go. And I literally had to stop and reflect that, okay, what is it that is eating me up right now? What is it that's actually making me feel bad? Because it's not the money and the success that is filling up that void for me. Yeah, look, so I, I don't know how transparent or vulnerable you want to get here. I've had people cry on my show. I'm not asking you to do that. But do you have any stories that you can share with that some of the things you went through? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I moved uh, here to Southern California from the Philippines when I was six. So there was that instant uh, life of not feeling accepted in a place outside of my home. And inside my home, you know, I was growing up with uh, two divorced parents. And as a six-year-old, you don't really know what divorce is. And I also had a mother that was going through depression. And when you're six, you know, you're still in the developmental stages of childhood. And I saw myself with my dad having a great relationship. And when I would compare that to my mother, I felt like there was something wrong with me because I wasn't receiving that emotional connection, that physical touch that I really wanted, the I love you's, I'm proud of you. And so I always grew up with this sense of unworthiness. And because because I had that sense of unworthiness, how that transpired into adulthood, is that I was constantly seeking validation. I didn't know where that came from. I just knew that I, I, I constantly felt unworthy. And I felt like the more that I put into my life, the more that I purchased things, you know, the more friends I had, that eventually I would feel worthy. But, you know, by the time I became an executive producer by the age of 30 for NBC's The Biggest Loser, yes, I was very grateful. But at the same time, I still felt like I wasn't good enough. 
you know? So while I was financially successful, when it came to happiness, I was bankrupt, you right, know? Right. So it really took me uh, being able to go into an introspective world and touch back with that six-year-old who was really hurting. And I realized that I'm really the only person that can heal him. Was there, was there a moment that you got t- like sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do you remember the moment where you just said, I got to do something about this? Yeah, the moment that I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired was I, you know, developed this addiction to alcohol. I I reached a point where I was drinking two bottles of wine a night and I was doing this for years. No one knew uh, about this life because it wasn't even social drinking anymore. It was literally me in my backyard and two bottles of wine a night. Um, and then there was one morning I woke up where it had expanded beyond two bottles and I was, I looked around, I was still extremely hungover, potentially drunk. And I was like, I'm actually going to die if I continue to live this life, you know? And this was my, my algorithm, you know, it was drinking at night and then showing up at work the next day and then drinking at night and then showing up at work the next day. And I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, something I've noticed for myself is, as I achieve more and, and get notoriety and success and all these different things, it's not what I thought it was. And then I look, and then I have to tell myself, wait a minute, go back five years ago, 10 years ago, and imagine that you have the life that you have now, would you be happy? And it's like, holy, sh- yeah, <laughs> like that I could, I wouldn't be able to believe some of the things that I've achieved. And so I've reflect like when you became an executive producer, like I, now, by the way, let's do this first executive producer. What does that actually mean in, in Hollywood? Yeah. So in Hollywood, being an executive producer for a show is you're basically running a business. So the same as, you know, running a restaurant or a company, when you're running, when you're an executive producer for a show, you are choosing the key department heads, you're casting the show, you're choosing the location, you're choosing a production designer who's going to build the set. Um, And you're basically, simply put, you're making a concept become concrete. So just like any other business, Right. And then you're managing a very large team of people. And your job is to make that idea, which you can't really touch, make it something that you can visually see on a television screen or anything digital, you know, by the time it airs. And are you the one with the vision as an executive producer? Or is there somebody else that kind of hires you to fulfill their vision? Yeah. So there are shows that have already been created in terms of the initial concept. And then I help flush it out, construct it. Um, and then there are shows where basically I come up with the whole thing and then flesh it out some more and then construct that. So it's, it's gotcha. a mix. Gotcha. So did, did, when you got to that point where you were the first time you were an executive producer, did you get to that point where you're like, it, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be necessarily. And then also reflect back. Yeah, absolutely. It reached a point where I, I mean, I live in Los Angeles, especially, which is the city of what's next. And I remember being the EP of The Biggest Loser. I'm like, all right, what's next? And then you partner with another star and then you do another big right. show. And it was just this, this destination addiction, if you will. And that's the thing, Mike, was that I had this idea that happiness existed in a place outside of myself. And so I was constantly looking for exterior happiness. And it yeah. wasn't until I realized that that destination, it's like being in a mall and it says, you are here. And I'm like, oh, happiness is actually like right here where I can't, I don't know how to, how do I tap into my emotions? How do I connect with my inner child? It wasn't until I found out that I was actually the source of the happiness versus the seeker of it. Yeah, and so what tools did you use for, to figure that out? Because I know yeah. like, you, you know you're working on the wellness company now. Change your algorithm, but like, what? Obviously, you learned it from something first, right? And then you you're going into creating this wellness company. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, back to when I. Uh, realized that I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I asked for help. I actually checked myself into treatment. I took myself into rehab and I felt like I was a contestant on one of my own TV shows <laughs> because I had yeah. to let go of control. There I was in a house filled with a bunch of strangers and I'm like, holy cow, uh, what have I gotten myself into? But I got to work with therapists and I learned things that I am baffled we're not teaching kids today uh, in schools because I was learning about how I'm not my thoughts. I was learning about how all of my emotions are valid. I was learning how to practice forgiveness. I was learning about mindfulness, about how to set boundaries with other people as well as ourselves and how my inner voice is more important than the opinions and thoughts of others because I was very good with people pleasing. Mm-hmm. You know, so the amount of lessons that I learned was endless. And those are the same lessons that I'm using now in my free mental wellness program, Change Your Algorithm. Now, and how can the audience get a uh, copy of that or, or access it? 
Yeah, so Change Your Algorithm, it's an online platform where we now have a very, very large team of volunteer mental health professionals. I spent $70,000 in rehab. And so by the time I left, I made it my goal to make sure that other people don't have to spend a single penny. Um, so we have a team of therapists. And then if you go to changealgorithm.com, you're going to be able to see a list of classes. They're all mental health classes led by mental health professionals. And we have a beautiful community of zero judgment and it's all about uh, compassion, kindness, and being able to just listen and attend and show up for yourself and for others. Love it, man. That's phenomenal. You know, I grew up around a lot of broken people. And when I say broken, there was alcohol, drug addicts, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, and then the, the, the prescriptions that come along with that and the rabbit hole that that comes along with. My grandmother committed suicide uh, from those drugs so this, this means a lot to me, man. And I just want to thank you, first of all, man to man, just for what you're doing, uh, because it hits home with me. And uh, yeah, it means a lot. So what did you notice the biggest difference in your career once you got straight and figured everything out? Um, oh my gosh. Once I became sober, first of all, I had more energy, <laughs> more clarity. I was much more passionate and I just had a sense of purpose. In the past, I was given a show and I would say, all right, how do I make the show great? And then the next show, how do I make this show great? But now I really have that poignant sense of purpose. And right now my, my purpose is to break that mental health stigma and to work on shows that support that, you know? So I'm really all about media and mental health. Um, so now that I have a much clearer mind, I cannot believe how much creativity actually stems from that. Yeah, I, I agree, man, and mission mission being clear on that mission and having a binary decision towards or away clears up all kinds of chaos and confusion man i just absolutely love that so how how do you connect with people like lebron james or ashley kutcher or the, like how do you like what happened what's the what's the chain of events that, that leads you into that place where you're now have the trust to work with someone like that Absolutely. So, you know, it all started really when I was working on NBC's The Biggest Loser. And then uh, the person that used to run the show, who is my mentor, created his own company. And then he got to work with companies like Spring Hill, which is LeBron's company, as, as well as Ashton Kutcher. And so it's really about making those connections, you know, and really working with people that share that same mission with you. And I was really honored that they wanted to work with me as well. And I think that that life is filled with so much blessings. And when things like that happen, it's like you hang on to it and you don't let go, right? Because it's a wacky world that we live in. So when yeah. you find someone amazing and good, such as yourself, Mike, you know, you, you make that a part of your tribe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like I uh, grew up such a sports fan and I would, uh, you know, go to the ball games. And if they gave, they gave me a ball, I mean, it would like just lose my mind. Right. And as I grow up, I still have, feel like I have this kid inside of me. And as I'm hanging more with the people that are like sports figures or celebrities and things, I still sometimes have to pinch myself because I'm like, how did I get to this place? You don't feel like I don't personally, I still, maybe that's a self-value, self-worth problem. I mean, I, I have no problems there that I know of, but I think maybe sometimes there's still some kind of issue there. Me being transparent with everybody listening or watching that, like, I'm like, how the heck did I get here? You know, but um, I think there's a fine line there because also if you go too far away from that and say, I belong here, you, you, right. you might be a legend in your own mind. So, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you feel yeah, with that? Right. When you go, how did I get here? This is amazing. I deserve to be here. I belong here. Like that is the way to go. But when you say, how did I get here? I don't deserve this. And you're going through imposter syndrome, right? And imposter syndrome is still when you're um, handling your own uh, sense of uh, self-esteem and your sense of worth because you think you don't deserve those accolades and accomplishments and whatnot. And for a lot of people that go through imposter syndrome, I go like, you claim that success. You claim, you know, that greatness, that happiness because you deserve it. Right. And that's what I had to work with was that I felt like I didn't deserve the success that I was having in my life, despite having success in my life. And it didn't take anyone. It could not take anyone else around me to say, no, Joel, you deserve it. It took me to say that I deserve it. And when you went on that journey of self-improvement and, and cleaning some things up, did you have people around you kind of uh, discouraging you on that journey? One hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I had a lot of people that said mental health isn't sexy. You know, like, how are you going to do like mental health and media? Like no one really wants to hear about depression. And the reason why I am thankful for what I went through is because 
I've, I'm so passionate about talking about overcoming depression, overcoming uh, how to cope with anxiety, how to overcome addiction, because I remember those really, really dark moments in my life. And that is what makes me want to go past the opinions of others that try to uh, stop me from doing that, you know, because it is so personal for me. And I think when something is personal for you, you're going to stand stronger above the opinions of others. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I'd say to myself sometimes, and I think I did a video on this on social one time, but recently I said, man, I am so glad that the results that I'm seeing in other people's lives that where we're impacting that I didn't quit when people were like discouraging me and, and, and saying that I wasn't going to be able to do it or stupid or, you know, I've had people, some of the closest people to me, and I'm, I'm not like hiding this. They know this, that like, Hey, we need to reel you back in, man. You're going too far with this or, why don't you go do your podcast? Why don't you go, you know, and I just keep storing that stuff in my tank, brother. Like, Hey, keep saying more. Cause I'm going to go further and further. And I'm so glad I didn't quit though. You know, yeah, because 100%. Yeah. there were a lot of people that, that said the same, you know, for me. And I look back and I go, I wouldn't have accomplished as much as I did. You know, change your algorithm is only about a year and a half old and I wouldn't have accomplished as much as we have to be able to be partnered with Chag featured in USA Today, to be opening in Italy, Canada, and the UK. If I listened to those people that said, what are you doing? You shouldn't do that, right? And I still have to take the high road and I, I don't go, see, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. I just feel like, like to have them watch for themselves. There's a German word called schadenfreude. Schaden meaning uh, misfortune and Freude meaning joy. And schadenfreude is when somebody wouldn't mind seeing, you know, someone just be stagnant or even get misfortune. And the reason why that exists is because they feel like they are not at a level that is to their expectation. So they try to wish that other people are on their level. So when people say negative things about us, it has really nothing to do about you. It's more of a reflection of how they feel about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, man. So now that I know this is different now that you've uh, gotten sober and, and you're on a mission now, but now currently what goes through your mind when you're by yourself and you can get as transparent and vulnerable as you want, but what's goes, what's something that's, a, you know, a repetitive thing that you feel or think, or what do you think about while you're by yourself? Yeah. When I think about um, when I'm by myself, I like to practice being the observer of my thoughts. And like I said, that's one of the biggest lessons I'd ever learned when I would call myself, you know, uh, worthless, unlovable, not successful. I believed all of those thoughts. Right. And so when those thoughts come back, I go, oh, I'm just going to observe that. Right. And the reason the reason why the program is called Change Your Algorithm is because I like to compare it to, you know, the algorithm that we all abide by. And unlike, you know, things that we can actually change our own algorithm. So when I fall back into that old behavior of, oh, you don't deserve this. I just observe it and I go, oh, yeah, that was just a thought. I don't have to believe it. Right. When people go to travel, you know, TSA is going to check your bags before they even get you in the plane. We get to do that with our thoughts. So when we have a negative thoughts, check that shit, you know, question it, challenge it, go, is this thought real? Because if it's not, I'm not gonna let it in plane, right? Our thoughts become our beliefs and we function off of our beliefs. Yeah, yeah. And have you laid out what your mission is in like one sentence or two sentences? That My like, mission? Yeah, yeah, like I mean, like for example, cause like I said, I, I love mine because it's just a binary decision. If I have to think, say or do something does it serve that or doesn't it and i get rid of it if it doesn't and it makes my life easier yeah 100 i mean my mission really is to replace judgment with compassion um, towards other people as well as myself i think we live in such a judgmental society and you know we we grow up feeling judged and then we start to judge others and i feel like once you replace that with compassion not only are you taking it uh much more loving towards yourself, but you start beating yourself up. It was judgment that got me depressed. It was judgment that made me anxious. It was judgment that would make me go to the liquor store at two in the morning, you know? But once I'm compassionate with myself, I actually feel like I am my own best friend and I don't feel like I have to look for somebody else to make me feel good or something to make me feel good. Right, yeah, no, I love it, man. I love it. So what's the vision for the future? What do you have on the works right now for us to look out for? 
Yeah, so I have a show with ABC that's going to be airing um, this Thanksgiving. I can't say too much about it yet, but there'll be a press release coming out soon. Um, I have another show with YouTube Originals that's going to be airing during the holidays uh, that is going to be about, you know, uh, celebrating the Jewish community and fighting anti-Semitism. Um, the last show that we did with them was about Stop Asian Hate. So it's an honor to be able to do these specials on all marginalized mm -hmm. communities. Um, when it comes to change our algorithm, as I mentioned, we're going to be opening up in Italy. And then after that, we're going to do UK and then Canada. So my mission is to break that mental health stigma. I love it, brother. I love it. And look, I want to support everything that you do. I'm going to be watching and I'm going to bring attention to it as best I can. If you ever need anything, anybody I might be connected with that you're not, whatever. I, I don't know what I could do to help you, but I want to help you, man. Because uh, Same I love, here. I love it, man. And, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, matter of fact, I just went out to LA the first time in my life, I'm 44 years old, and, uh, two weeks ago. And I spent oh, out, I, I, yeah, I was out in um, Hollywood Hills there and for a week and I was doing some work for my, on myself and came back fired up. And I just, I, I, I'm going back to California again, uh, I think two weeks now, cause I just loved it so much. So, so uh, but yeah, San Diego this time. So anyway, look, man, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Anything I could do, as I mentioned, let me know. The best way for people to reach out to you or engage with you is through that, uh, the website for the algorithm. Yeah, you can check it out at changealgorithm.com or you can just DM me on Instagram. It's my name, at Joel Relampios. All right, awesome, Joel. I appreciate you, brother. I look forward to building a relationship with you, man. And I got to thank Amelia for introducing me to you, man, because you're phenomenal, dude. 100% to you as well, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thank you guys for listening. Keep coming back. Subscribe to the podcast. Go support Joel. Watch out for his shows because he's on to something huge for impact, man. A force for good, a real force for good. And until next time, be unstoppable. Thank <laughs> you.